Oh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. And can you see my slides? Uh, yes, sir. You can make this as a full slide mode. You click on the slides. Yes, it's okay. perfectly fine, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. And this is uh, just before lunch. I understand everybody is hungry. I will not take much time. Uh, and uh, uh, when uh, Dr. Ranjit invited me for this uh, topic, I was gladly accepted uh, because uh, I understand that this is very important topic each and every doctor should know. Uh, medical, every doctor in medical discipline, uh, medical profession, they should know. Anyway, thank you for my kind from your kind introduction, and uh, allow me to speak in kind of uh, invitation. Today we will discuss forensic aspect in clinical practice, and uh, I, you know this is a huge subject. Dr. Hemlata also mentioned that this is a huge topic. We have to select a little portion of uh, the topic that is the magnetic portion of the topic, and then we can discuss. There are we we have decided our lecture, my lecture, into three main topic. One is scope in clinical forensic, and another is injury and non-accidental injury. That is very, very important in the forensic aspect and forensic perspective and student as, uh, sexual assault examination. That is also one of the important things we will discuss today. The, as you know, as a doctor, there are different branches of forensic medicine. And those are, you know, uh, the major are forensic pathology, forensic toxicology, forensic odontology, forensic thanatology, forensic anthropology, forensic psychiatry, all these I know you already know. Now we discuss about forensic, uh, 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 clinical forensic medicine. Clinical forensic medicine, this is a branch of forensic medicine concerning with living person and involved and interaction among the law and judiciary and the police. That is very simple. This is the only branch in medical science which deals with connect with the court and medicine. And in between, there is police. The scope of forensic medicine, there are three main scope. One is, oh my God. One is assessment, what? One is assessment and investigation of medical findings in living person. And that is, we not only dealt with the dead bodies, we also work with the living person. Examination of victims and suspected perpetrators in cases of criminal assault, rape, child abuse, and domestic violence. This we have to do, and others like traffic medicine and custodial medicine. All these, these are our scope of work other than medical legal things, that is forensic, uh, that is uh, dead bodies. Now, first part, that is a clinical uh, for scope of forensic uh, medicine, we uh, uh, just in little we discuss, but now main part is injury and non-accidental injury. We have to determine which one, which one is non-accidental injury. When any case comes to us, we have to determine non-accidental injury. That is injuries that medical legal consideration and types when we discuss, that is there are three types. We in forensic practice, we see own trauma and injury. Although everything almost, uh, almost same, but we have to differentiate as forensic pathology as a doctor. An injury that is what is owned and injury to living tissue caused by a cut, blow, and other impact, typically one of which the skin is cut or broken. That is dissolution of natural continuity. It is caused by a mechanical force, which may be either a moving weapon or object or the movement of the body itself. And the type of infliction of injury, body may be moved. And uh, another is trauma is an assault to the living tissue it applies as well as emotional or mental stress. Uh, 
and finally injury any harm whatever legally we have to think of it character of injury depends upon the nature and shape of the weapon uh, that is you know pointed weapon have some okay can you see okay point, point, can you see my my slides it depends upon the it depends upon that the shape of the weapon the amount of energy in the weapon or instrument when it strikes the body and whether inflicted or moved move moving or if or, or a fixed body and the nature of the tissue involved and the area over the force act acts these are very important because small uh, small area involved in minimum force also can cause major injury on the other hand major area maximum force also less injury sometimes this thing happen so classification of injury in forensic we have to in forensic we have to discuss also the weapon as well as as well as injury when there is question of classification comes at first we tell what is the weapon for example blunt weapon it is cause abrasion it, it may cause abrasion contusion laceration sharp weapon it cause incised on chop stab or chop on stab injury firearms that is blast injuries as well as thermal frostbite hot burn scald chemical corrosive acid or alkali and others electricity or lightning these are in uh, uh, our our forensic classification medical importance that is gives idea about the site of impact the direction of force that is as a doctor when we examine any injury at first we have to think that is the site of impact and direction of force only external organs of severe internal injury pattern of wound can identify the weapon suppose any any suppose any type of uh, 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 looking at the pattern we can we can tell what is the the weapon was what was the weapon age of injury can be determined by color changes that we will discuss later and scene of crime can be determined by the presence of dirt dust grease etc again i am telling you as a doctor we have to determine first thing when there is an injury this is intermortem or postmortem injury for example in case of abrasion abrasion into mortem anywhere of the on the body and postmortem abrasion it is over the bony prominence color bright reddish brown and postmortem abrasion yellow is translucent and parchment black exudation more scab slightly raised and less scab often lies slightly below below level of the skin microscopy there's intravital reaction and congestion seen in intermortem abrasion and no intravital reaction and no congestion by looking at that we can determine this is intermortem or this is postmortem you can see the picture intermortem picture it is reddish in color and this one you see this is whitish like parchment right age of bruise or contusion how we determine a bruise heals by destruction and removal of extra vascular blood the more vascular the area the smaller the contusion hello hello yes sir you are audible sir you, you can hear huh? yes sir yes sir you are audible right? okay 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 the more more vascular the area and the smaller the contusion the more rapid will be the healing the color changes starts at the periphery and extend towards the center the first day we can see the color of the bruise is red and then in few hours to 3 days it become blue four days bluish black to brown that is due to hemosiderin five to six days it is greenish due to hemo hemotoidin and seven to 12 
two days it is yellow because of bilirubin and two weeks normal depends on the size of the bruise it is uh, uh, these are the important and you see age of the bruise by color this is reddish in color in few hours to three days this is blue in color bluish in color this is four day to five day uh, four days this is a brown blackish to brown and uh, five to six days this is green greenish in color and finally seven to twelve days it is yellowish and it is normal all pictures are not from the same um, body and that's why it looks a little bit uh, different and a little bit confusing and tears are split of skin, mucous membrane, muscle, or internal organ produced by application of blunt force to broad area of the body, which crushed or stressed to stressed tissue beyond the limits of their elasticity. If the force produces the bleeding into the adjacent tissue, there is contus or laceration or bruise tear, like, like, like this. And the margin abraded, when the margin abraded, we call abraded laceration or scrap tear, or extensive bruise or laceration of deeper tissue causing crushing injury. It is called crushing injury. All these are lacerated injury, but this is the variety of, of all these are bruise and lacerated injury, but variety, different varieties. Now we are in non accidental injury. Non accidental injury uh, gives uh, our. Uh, give us as a forensic pathologist a lot of trouble. And uh, a non accident injury is a common condition in children and carries a significant morbidity and mortality. And the uh, three categories predisposing of non accidental injury one is child factor, one is parental factor, and another is social factor. Mm -hmm. Child factor that is disability, learning difficulties, behavior, pro behavior problem, adaptation, and the parental factor mental health problem, alcohol, drug abuse, domestic violence, previous abuse of, of a child, as a child, and social factor. And, and, and this is very, uh, that is we usually find in case of single parent or um, young parents, new partner, poverty, and you know, unemployment, these also involve uh, this non-accidental injury. And a spectrum of injury, that is, uh, uh, that may be soft tissue injury, that may be thermal injury, that may be skeletal injury, that internal organs, the brain or abdomen or eye, or fabricated or induced illness, that also we can see. And as a doctor, we have to differentiate all these. Suspicion, when suspicion comes to our mind, that is delay in presentation of the injury, discrepant or, uh, discrepant or absent history, history incompatible with the injury, pattern of injury more suggestive of abuse, repetitive injuries, and injuries also of different ages, and unusual paternal behavior of mood, children's demeanor, behavior or interactions with the parents and caregiver unusual, and disclosure by child or witness. This, when this thing happened, this is just a suspicion in our mind and we inform the authority. This is, you know, usually accidental injury. This is everywhere, this is possible. Head in your head to toe, that is possible for accidental injury. But non-accidental injury, although same, but you know, especially punch mark, you can see in some areas, soft tissue, cheek, oral injury, black eyes. You know, these are common in case of non-accidental injury. Okay, now sexual assault examination. Sexual assault examination, that is the basic principles, and the basic principles of forensic analysis, medical examination, and forensic evidence. But uh, nowadays, there is a one-stop crisis center. It so resolves all of our problem. In one station, we can get all these services. But one thing, the immediate care, we have to take the patient. Urgent attention to any immediate medical needs, that is substance overdose, head injury, uh, wounds. You know, if there is, we have to take care first. 
After that, we will go for medical legal matter and medical legal issues. Any clothing or sanitary wear that were removed must be kept. We have to keep it for further investigation. And you see, basic principles of examination. These are the room uh, usually uh, placed in every hospital or one-stop crisis center. We should do, you know, uh, as soon as possible, we do examination. The timing of the examination should be influenced by clinical science. Bruce Mark will, uh, if there is a late Bruce Mark will be fade or some other changes. You can you can see this is the standard room. And chain of custody, we also follow because most of the cases are medical legal cases and medical legal cases without chain of custody, it is not acceptable in the court. The initial part is planning and forensic service starts after treatment. Treatment even when there is any patient comes, we have to treat first. And after that, we will go for, for uh, other uh, you know, investigations in the reactive phase and maturity phase, all these we have to pass. The chain of custody is a legal term that refers to ability to guarantee the identity and integrity of the evidence from collection through uh, to reporting of the case the test results. It also refers to the documents or paper trial showing the recovery, custody, cust uh, control, transfer, analysis, and deposition of evidence. Everything it covers, we have to keep it. Otherwise, nowadays, you see DNA analysis. You know, in DNA, it is most, most important. Contamination, we have to, we have to prevent. Basic principle of medical examination, there is place of examination. In nowadays, this is one-stop crisis center. This is invented in Malaysia. And in Malaysia, each and every hospital have their facilities. One stop. That is informed consent. Mihamlata Lata also discussed informed consent. Yes, we have to do informed consent, not implied. That is in that place, uh, uh, we have to take informed consent along with, uh, together for special examination, equipment use, that is speculum, relevant forensic samples, and photo documentation, everything we have to do. And a date, uh, an allegation. That is, uh, detail of allegation can be provided by the third party, and that can be qualified, clarified to complainant if necessary. An attempt to be obtained to detail a history of an incident of the complainant may jeopardize the case of trial. And at the time of medical examination, the patient may be disturbed, and consequently, the details of the incident may be confused and conflict, and conflict subsequent statement. And this thing also, uh, when we examine, we have to keep this in mind. Medical and documentary. Uh, 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 medical and sexual history, there's two purposes. First, to identify and behavior and medical conditions that may cause the doctor to misinterpret the clinical findings, for example, ministerial bleeding. And second, to identify any medical problems that may attributable to the sexual assault, for example, bleeding, pain, discharge, all these uh, conditions we have to consider during our examination and history taking. And when children are examined, the parents and Caregiver should be provided comprehensive detail of the past of the medical history. Without medical history, we cannot start any examination. When adults are examined, only relevant medical and sexual history should be sought because confidentiality cannot be granted here. And finally, this is very important, should not ask suspects about the alleged incident or sexual in history. Don't ask. This, this, this thing on the same reason because of confidentiality. In all cases, in all cases, a complete general medical examination should be conducted to document injuries and note to all diseases that may affect the interpretation of medical findings and in child or incapacity adult person with legal authority to consent on behalf of the patient, on behalf of the patient. And analyze analysis that ensure 
that there is no accidental transfer of body fluids or fiber between the parties, between the parties. That is, we always keep this in my, our mind. Glove should be, gloves should be on throughout the forensic examination and chain when sampling different area. Suppose we examine axilla, that time we have one gloves. We, when we change another axilla, that time also we change the gloves and, and, and keep that gloves for further investigation. Any places we have to change the gloves. And in some jurisdiction require that all used gloves should be retained for an exhibit. And prevention of contamination, how we prevent contamination? Should avoid talking, coughing, or sneezing over unsealed samples. And we don't allow any third parties to be there during the examination. And face mask should be on, should be on uh, when the sample is being obtained. Nowadays, corona, corona, because of corona, we usually use uh, 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 face, face uh, mask every time. But uh, you know, apart from that, we have to use face mask, especially uh, sometimes a double face mask in case of uh, a forensic analysis. And collection of sample, swabs should be made of fibers and readily release the absorbed material, a standardized clinical and forensic examination kits of the module. And in Malaysia, uh, ministry have given that forensic kits to every hospital. And that kits consist of one tray for safe, uh, these gloves and uh, swab, and uh, uh, that is uh, way, for sample, that is the slides, gauge and uh, mm, a specimen pot, everything in, in, a, in a box, they supply it each time we can, uh, uh, sterilized item we can use during the examination. And packaging and continuity within the chain of custody, that is any retrieved item must be packed quickly and efficiently to prevent accidental loss of material and minimize decomposition of the sample. Use of the bags with integral temper evident and exhibit should be leveled with the site of the sample, the date and time it was obtained, and the name of the examinee. Actually, before we start examination, in my practice, we, we fill that uh, level. And after that, we put level in the envelope or bottle containing uh, any container. And after that, we start our examination. And this is police uh, sometimes also give some samples for examination, for their examination in the same way. And forensic evidence also, this thing also important, I'm, I'm almost last. And the areas of unwashed skin that have been light, leaked, kissed, sucked, and beaten or ejaculated on, on by either the assailant or the compliant must be sampled. And the semen stain can be detectable when using high intensity light sources of the valuable or uh, uh, spatial goggles that is an ultraviolet uh, uh, ray also we can use. Here should be sampled by cutting of the F, uh, if they appear to be contaminated by materials that has been potential to have forensic significance. Suppose some portion of hair you can see some semen is there, you need not to uh, take the hair from the root, you just cut and collect. Any foreign particles and hair identified of the head or pubic hair should be collected with forceps and submitted for analysis. And pubic hair may be transferred between individuals during sexual intercourse, sexual intercourse. Public hair, a pubic hair transfer were observed 17.3% of the time using macroscopic and microscopic comparison and present of spermatozoa that is the maximum recorded interval between the act of anal intercourse and the identification of spermatozoa on a rectal swab is 65 hours less than 65 hours we have to collect the sample and swab should be taken even if the compliant has defecated since the assault and finally you understand all the forensic discipline involved in all the forensic discipline uh, face the forensic all the discipline face the forensic that's why we have to know little forensic all discipline you see the uh, the vulnerable subjects most vulnerable subjects that is we call champion that is obstetrics and gynae but other than that 
surgery, orthopedics, ophthalmology, pediatrics, radiology, transfusion, blood transfusion, even dentistry, anesthesially not beyond the uh, beyond the reach of forensic aspect. I think. Thank you very much. This is all from me. And thank you for your attention. I've taken uh, photographs for this presentation from different sources. This is not my own photographs. Thank you very much.